We're in the series, we're in a series through the book of Jude called Fighting for the Faith. And the main verse, the, the, the key verse of our series is Jude chapter 1 and verse 3, which says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which is once for all handed down to the saints. Now, I remember my mom taking me to church when I was little. We went to a church called Friendship Baptist Church, and it was an old church. And I remember my dad would never go, but my mom would take me as a child, would take me to Friendship Baptist Church. And we wouldn't maybe not go every single week, but we would go more often than we didn't. And that was my, mem- my earliest memories of uh, going to church and of course as kids you know you hit four or five vacation bible schools a summer and uh so you know we 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 hit a whole bunch of those and i remember growing up after my parents divorced uh, me and my mom started going to a church called open door baptist church and went there for many years until my mom remarried my first stepdad then we started going to his church which was bela chitta baptist church we went there a few years until the church that me and mom was in previously opened door until they started a Christian school. I transferred to that Christian school and then started going faith, faithfully to open door. I went to open door the whole time I was a teenager. We were, I was faithful Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, didn't miss a service. And then we went to open door until I was college age. And then I went to college at Hiles Anderson College, a Bible college in Hammond, Indiana, right outside of Chicago. When I was going uh, to college there, the church that I attended was First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. And I went to that church the whole time I was at Hiles Anderson. I transferred to a new school, Tri-State Baptist College, which is in Walls, Mississippi, right outside of uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, there I went to Bethel Baptist Church, and that was Emily's home church. And that's where we met and got married there uh, while going and attending to Bethel Baptist Church. After I graduated Bible college, I came back to my home church at Open Door Baptist Church, and I was there, uh, you know, I was there uh, as an assistant pastor for eight years, of course, going to church faithfully the whole time. After I left Open Door, I went to Kentwood, Louisiana. I pastored in Kentwood. I pastored Chesbro Baptist Church for six years, attending there. And then after I left there, I came here. And this coming June will make two years that I've been at Rocky Point Baptist Church. And I said all that to say that, you know, I've been going to church for a long time. I've been going to church. I know some of you in here have went to church a lot longer than I have. But I have been going to church most of my life. I've seen a lot of people come into the church. I've seen a lot of lives change that have come into the church. But I've also seen a lot of people leave the church, unfortunately. I've seen a lot of people come, but then I've also seen a lot of people go. Did you know that 66% of young adults who attend a Protestant church on a regular basis, they drop out for at least a year between the ages of 18 and 22. And a lot of those that drop out of church, they never come back to church. Did you know that a study was done that said three out of every four Christian pastors know and are dealing with this thing of deconstruction? That they have members in their church that are deconstructing from the faith. And that leaves 25% of pastors that don't even know what the word means, have never heard it. But there are 75% of Christian pastors, three out of every four, that not only know what deconstruction is, but they deal with it in their churches. Meaning they have people that have left the faith or in the process of questioning and leaving their faith. Get this next one. One in six Gen Z adults. Who is Gen Z? That's your kids. Your kids are Gen Z. One in six Gen Z adults identify as LGBTQIA+. One in six. What is going on? 
What's going on? What, what's really going on? Well, what's going on now is the same thing that's been happening in the church since the very beginning. I'm getting ready to tell you what the greatest threat to the church is. The greatest threat to the church is not outside persecution. That's not the greatest threat to the church. The greatest threat to the church is not the government. That's not what the greatest threat to the church is. The greatest threat to the church is spiritual deception within the church. Spiritual deception from within. I want to tell you. Real quick story about a criminal profiler by the name of John E. Douglas. In the years of night between 1979 and 1981, there was a string of disappearances in Atlanta, Georgia. The police come to the realization that they have to be dealing with a serial killer. The serial killer would kidnap young children and young adults. And it was an epidemic. They had to do something about it. So they brought in a criminal profiler by the name of John E. Douglas. This is really his first big case. He worked for the FBI and he came into Atlanta, Georgia, and he studied all the cases and he saw where the crimes took place. And he he wrote out a criminal profile of this killer. He gave the profile to the police. The profile led them to a man by the name of Wayne Williams. And they were able to link several of the disappearances to Mr. Williams. They put Mr. Williams on the stand. And because Johnny Douglas has a uh, degree in psychology, he was able to work with the prosecutors and, 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 and told them what questions to ask. And how to ask these questions in order to trigger the anger that Mr. Douglas knew was in Mr. Williams. And it worked. On the stand, Mr. Williams blew up and gave himself, blew up in anger and gave himself away. And all of the disappearances were linked to Mr. Williams. And he was convicted as a serial killer. This was Johnny Douglas' first big case. He became well known in the world of criminal profiling, writing many textbooks on the subject. And the reason why he was so good is because he would travel around the country and he would interview high profile killers. Some of the names that are on his interviewee list is he interviewed the likes of Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy. Charles Manson, James Earl Ray, Richard Speck, to name a few. And in fact, if you've ever seen the TV show Criminal Minds, that show is based off of his life. Now you may ask me, Brett, what are you doing? Why are you up on here and up here on a Sunday morning talking about an FBI serial killer profiler? Why are you doing that? Because I believe that's what Jude did in his letter. I believe this short letter of Jude is a criminal profile of an apostate. I believe that Jude has written a criminal profile of apostates to the church. Saying, you want to know how to recognize apostates in the church? This is how you recognize them. Because since the beginning, the church has been plagued with spiritual deception from within. After the disciples dropped off the scene and died out, it didn't take long for spiritual deception within the church to begin to pervert the church. And if you look over church history, you know for a long time, for thousands of years, the church went off the rails. Till about 500 years ago. The reformers left that perverted religious system, went back to faith alone, went back to Bible alone, went back to saying we are not saved by works, we are saved by faith and faith alone, went back to sola scriptura and said the Bible is our final rule of faith and practice. And that's what they did. But even today... 
the church is still fighting spiritual deception from within. There are two types of apostates in the Christian's church. An apostate is somebody that was given the faith. They've been given the truth. They've been given the gospel, but they left it. They left it behind. They left the faith that was given to us once and for, once and for all. Now, there are two types of these apostates. There are those that not only leave the faith, but also leave the church. But then there are those that are the real problem. They leave the faith, but they stay in the church and pervert the church from within. Don't believe me? Let me read for you today some actual quotes from Christian pastors who are pastors of churches today. These are apostates in the church, but they're pastors of Christian churches. And they were interviewed... And their identities were concealed. One pastor said, I reject the virgin birth. I reject substitutionary atonement. I reject the divinity of Jesus. I reject heaven and hell in their traditional sense. And I am not alone. Another Christian pastor said, here's how I'm handling my job on Sunday mornings. I see it as play acting. I see myself as taking on the role of a believer in a worship service and performing. Another pastor said, if not believing in a supernatural theistic God is what distinguishes an atheist, then I am one too. You want me to read to you the scariest paragraph in that article? This next one is a Southern Baptist pastor. He's currently right now on payroll pastoring a Southern Baptist church. John is identified as a Southern Baptist minister. He was attracted to Christianity as a religion of love, but his pursuit of Christianity brought me to the point of not believing in God. As he explains, I didn't plan to become an atheist. I didn't even want to become an atheist. It's just that I had no choice. If I'm being honest with myself, these are pastors of Christian churches pastoring today, pastors of Southern Baptist churches pastoring today. They left the faith that was given to them once and for all, but they did not leave the church and they want you to leave the faith too. So what Judas, you know, how we, I've showed you how dangerous this is. What Jude has done, he's written a letter. He's written out a criminal profile identifying these apostates. All through this letter, Jude has went back. And Jude has given us example after example after example of apostates. He gave us the example of Israel. He gave us the example of the angels, not only Michael and Satan, but he gave us the example of the angels being chained up in the abyss. He gave us the example of Korah and Balaam and Cain. He even went back before the flood and talked about Enoch. Last week, he gave us five metaphors to help us spot apostates. Last week, we talked about worrisome spots, waterless clouds, worthless trees, wild waves, and wandering stars. But Jude is not done. And this morning, between verses 16 and 19, he gives us a summary of this criminal profile that he's written. So let's read those verses this morning. Jude chapter 1, verses 16 through 19. These grumblers finding fault, following after their own lusts, they speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining advantage. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, and the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. They're the ones who cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of the spirit. I I, I have divided of the spirit. I have divided these verses into three categories. And they are the apostate's words, the apostate's walk, and the apostate's warnings. And then at the very end of the message, I'm going to give you 
I'm going to tell you very quickly how to protect yourself. So let's look at the first one, words, the apostate's words. The first thing I want to draw your attention to in this passage is how much Jude concentrates on what comes out of the apostate's mouth. I want to draw your attention to how much, now listen, listen to me now, I'm giving, to you, I'm giving you the word of God. This is explaining the scripture, okay? He's, he, wa- he wants you to concentrate on what comes out of their mouth, on the words that they say. Because the words that they say are the best clues to identifying these apostates. So let's go through these. So he's addressed all the examples given in this letter. So far he's talking about, he's talked about those men who, who, who put dreams as authority instead of the faith. They defile the flesh. He's talked about apostates who reject authority, who revile things they do not understand. He's talked about Korah and Balaam and Cain, all of them. What all these people have in common, number one, is they're all grumblers. They're all grumblers. They're all complainers. That's going to be your first clue. Your first clue is that they complain all the time. About everything. Listen, because when, when somebody gets out of touch with God, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to start complaining about something. We all know somebody like that. We all, everything can go right, and they're going to find something to complain about. We all know somebody like that. And it doesn't specifically address who they're complaining to or who they're complaining about. As I've said this before, every complaint that comes out of your mouth is about God. Let that sink in for a second. Let that sit there. Every complaint that comes out of your mouth is against God. You complain about your marriage. You complain about your job. You complain about your living situation. You complain about your circumstances. Who's in control of all that? God. God's the reason you're in the position you're in. Every complaint you have, every time you complain about your life, who you're really complaining about is God. These people in the New Testament, they're the equivalent to the Israelites in the wilderness. In fact, the Greek word here for grumbler, it's the only time that Greek word is used in the New Testament. But if you look back at the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you know who that word refers to? The Israelites. After God brought them out of Egypt... And, and, and gave them a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day and gave them water from a rock and, and gave them manna to eat in the wilderness. Freed them from slavery. What they say? Oh, that we were back in Egypt eating cucumbers. Now, don't get me wrong. I love me a good cucumber. You take that, soak it in some... Oh, get back to the world. Get back to the Word of God, Brett. Listen. They always can find something to complain about. Psalm 106, 25 through 26. Then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe in His Word, but grumbled in their tents. They did not listen to the voice of the Lord. You know, they may have been complaining about Moses. They may have been complaining about Aaron. They may have been complaining about the manna, how they wanted some meat. They may have been complaining about the barren desert. But God knew who they were really complaining about was him. They complained about everything. So that's the first thing. Here's the second thing. They're fault finders. They're fault finders. So not only do they complain about everything, but they take responsibility for nothing. These apostates, they take responsibility for 
Nothing. Everything is always somebody else's fault. You know somebody like that? Somebody that can do no wrong. And if they do do wrong, it's not their fault. It's somebody else's fault. Their sin is not their fault. It's your fault. Because you're not accepting of them. And you're not affirming of them. And once again, they pass the buck. And every time you pass the buck, and every time you lay blame at somebody else's feet, what you're doing is you're blaming God. Here's the thing about grumbling. Here's the thing about fault finding. You know what the thing is? Is it's not based on your circumstances. It's based on your character. You know how I know that? Because everything can be going right. Everything can be going right. And you can still find something to complain about. I knew this kid one time was given free. This family was given free football tickets. So they invited this young man to come with them to the LSU football game, which that was their first mistake. So they go to this football game, and the kid they invited complain from the time they got there to the time they left. Oh, it's hot. Oh, these crowds. Oh, this parking. Oh, these nosebleed seats. Can you believe how much a hot dog costs? Just complain, complain, complain the entire time. Complaining is not based on your circumstances because you can complain as human beings. We can complain in the best of circumstances. We can find something to grumble about. We can find a way to pass the buck. It's about your character. Let me tell you, let me explain something to you, Christian. God knows what we need. He knows what we need, he knows how we need it, and he knows when we need it. And all you need to know is that God knows what you need. That's the only thing you need to know. And God sits in heaven, and God says, I'm a good father. And God says, I'm a good provider. And we need to stop complaining. And we need to stop blame shifting. And we need to start praising. And we need to start worshiping. Next in the verse it says, following after their own lusts. Stick a pin in that. We'll get back to that in a minute. Then it says they speak arrogantly. And that's a Greek word called huparaka. Now huparaka is a word that actually means great, swelled up. Some of your English translations translate it literally. Great, big, swelled swelled up words. They puff up their words. They pump themselves up like a big hot air balloon. But you look on the inside of that balloon and there's nothing there. There's no substance. So they're very charismatic. And they're very charming. And their language is controversial because it gets people's attention. But at the end of the day, after all that puffing up, they've said nothing. They've said nothing of any substance. <clears throat> you ever read an article from a journalist who uses overcomplicated words? It's like obscure, overly complicated words. They write an article and you've got to get out a dictionary to understand what they're even talking about. Almost like they want to appear smart. Now, a lot of times that's a cover up because they don't have a lot to say. That's an apostate. They puff up like a big balloon. They raise up in the air and they make a big spectacle. And then they come down and land in the same spot and didn't take you anywhere. Raise your hand. Be honest. Raise your hand if you know who Edward Everett is. Okay, we got one person that I can see. Edward Everett stood up to dedicate a military cemetery in 1863 for Union soldiers who fell during the Civil War. 
He spoke for two solid hours. Two hours. Can I preach for two hours, brother? No? Okay. My wife said no. But he spoke for two hours. The President of the United States followed him. Abraham Lincoln. He got up and spoke for two minutes. And he gave the Gettysburg Address. Everybody here remembers Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. I got one person in here that knows who Edward Everett is. It's not about the quantity of what you say. It's the quality. You can write a law that can be 26,000 words long on how to tax cabbage. That's real. The Lord's Prayer is 256 words. Which one makes a bigger impact? Verse 16, flattering people for the sake of gaining advantage. Flattering people for the sake of gaining advantage. So these people tell you what you want to hear so that they can manipulate you and give themselves the advantage. Okay? Proverbs 29, 5, a man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps. You know what the Hebrew word for flatter means? It means smooth. So they're trying to be smooth with you. They want to be slick with you. The French word for f- that we get, the English word for flatter, it means to stroke someone's hair with the flat of your hand. They're trying to just coerce you and ease you into something. They're trying to be smooth and slick. So these people say what they want to say in order to control it, to control you. They speak arrogantly. They'll speak arrogantly. They'll flatter you. It doesn't matter. They'll come along and scratch your itching ears to get you to do what they want you to do, to give them the advantage. But you know, James chapter 2 in his letter tells us not to show partiality to those who come into the church. James chapter 2 is a warning to the church not to give the rich the seat of honor and push the poor people out of the building because we're all equal at the foot of the cross. Too many pastors, they want to butter up to the big tithers. That's what they want to do. I've seen it. I've been under pastors where if you were a big tither, you got all the attention, buddy. Got all the attention. And if you didn't tithe as much as this family over here, guess what? You got the cold shoulder. I've seen it. As a result, let me give you a fact about my ministry. I've been in the ministry, I've been a pastor for 15 years. I've been a lead pastor for eight years. Ask me how many times I've looked at the tithing record of any church I've worked at. Zero times. And even if I did, it would not change how I treated someone. These apostates will speak big words to impress. They'll speak flattering words to exploit. Listen to me, church. At the end of the day, do not choose charisma over character. Do you hear me? I don't care if the pastor is the most monotone preacher you've ever heard. Do not choose charisma over character. Too many churches have teachers whose teaching do not line up with the Bible, but they let it slide because the pastor says it in a charismatic way. When a preacher like Andy Stanley can stand up in his church and teach people to throw the Old Testament in the trash can and people don't get up and walk out of that service, it's because they'd rather have a false teacher scratching their itching ears. Someone that speaks big, beautiful words with no substance, just full of hot air and flatters them. And strokes their ego. 
rather than stand for the faith that was given to them once and for all. We talked about the words of the apostate. Now well, let's talk about the walk of the apostate. Verse 16, these grumblers finding fault following after their own lusts. Let's skip to verse 18. That they were saying to you in the last time there will be markers following after their own lusts. So what this verse is telling us here is the way they're talking is a result of the way they're walking. Because they walk according to their own lusts. In other words, they live according to their own cravings. Now, this, this, this idea of walk in the Bible, it has a double meaning of not only physically walking, but also how you live your life. There was a colleague of D.L. Moody who introduced him to a friend. And then D.L. Moody watched as that friend walked away from him and his colleague. And D.L. Moody looked at his colleague and said, your friend was in the army, wasn't he? And the colleague said, yes, he was. How do you know that? And D.L. Moody said, I can tell by the way he walks. These people, they walk according to their own lusts. In other words, they live by the mantra, follow your heart. Let your conscience be your guide. The heart wants what the heart wants. Live your best life now. YOLO. That's how they live. So false teachers like this in the church, since they're always attracted to the flesh, their messages and their teaching always come from the flesh, people will come from all over to hear them. They'll come all over to, to hear that teaching because it appeals to the flesh and not the spirit. People come from all over and say, yes, I want to be happy. Yes, I want to be healthy. Yes, I want to be wealthy. People want more of that. So they come back and they come back. And they put up with lies, camouflage is truth. And the church decays from the inside out. He goes into a little more, more detail. He says, these are the ones who cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of the spirit. I believe that's verse 19. So these apostates. They cause division in the church. So what happens with these apostates is cliques begin to form in the church. Unity is disrupted. People begin to disband. And then it tells us why. Because they're worldly minded. That word worldly minded is pasukikoi. Pasukikoi literally translated means soulish. They're not... They don't care about the spirit. They care about the soul. They're soulish. They're selfish. If it feels good, do it. Or more correctly in the church, how can it be wrong if it feels like it's the right thing to do? And then it says they are devoid of the spirit, which means they're unsaved. So I got a question here. Here's my question. Why in the world? Is a soulish, selfish, unsaved person go, going to church to begin with? Why are they in the church to begin with? And I heard a pastor say this, and I agree with him. I think it's because they want religious sanction for their sinful deeds. They want the church to give their blessing on their sin. They want to be able to call themselves Christians. They want to be able to be churchgoers, be able to hide behind the name of Jesus, but never change. But never repent. And it's never real and it's never authentic. So they can live how they want to live and have a stamp of religious approval. I still want the promise of heaven, but I don't want to do anything the Bible says. So their talk is grumbling and complaining and finger pointing. They talk big, swelling, arrogant words full of hot air with no substance. They will do and say anything to get their way. Their walk is after their own desire and their own lust because they're self-centered, soulish people devoid of the spirit, causing division in the church because they want to call themselves Christians, but then not walk according to the spirit. 
So now, very quickly, let's look at the warning that Jude gives in verse 17 and 18. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own godly lusts. That's what the apostles warned us about. So we go back to the book of Acts, the beginning of the church, and at the day of Pentecost, it's a great victory. Thousands of souls received Jesus and came into the church. The apostles are given the power and the authority to lead the church. Holy Spirit inspired them to write the New Testament. And in doing so, the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to see the future. The apostles could see the future. The apostles can look in the future and see Jesus coming back in his second coming. But that's not all they were given the ability to see. They were also given a vision of the churches falling away. They were given visions of the church abandoning, abandoning the truth. Whole congregations apostatizing. I've given you this stat before, but every New Testament book, with the exception of Philemon, warns against false teaching and false teachers. Jude was the last book written before Revelation was written. The book of Revelation is written after Jude. And the second and third chapter of the book of Revelation, Jesus writes letters to seven churches. Five of those churches had turned away from the truth in some way. Some of those churches were completely apostate. Jesus is outside the church knocking to get in because they threw Jesus out of the church. The book of Revelation was written in 95 AD. That's 27 years after Jude was written. Still in the first century. Man, that didn't take long, did it? And you look back over church history, and you see how Roman Catholicism began to reign in the church. And you look at these churches today, even today, these churches preaching this false doctrine, turning people away from the gospel. And, and, and listen, he says, don't be surprised. Don't be shocked by it. Because the New Testament, including Jude, warned us that it would be this way. So... What are we supposed to do now? Well, I'll tell you what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to test them. We're supposed to test them. Jude said, uh, we're to remember the words, the apostles. Remember the words of the apostles. And using the words of the apostles, test the false teachers and the false leaders. Like the Bereans in Acts 17, 11. Now these were more noble minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So those Bereans, they would take what the teachers said and, and they would hold it against the standard of the word of God. They didn't care how charismatic the teacher was. They didn't care how much the preacher used big flamboyant words. They didn't care how much he flattered him with their lips. They took his message and they held it up to the word of God. First John 4, 1 John 4.1 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Listen to me, just because you sit in a preaching service and have a religious experience does not mean that it came from God. Does not mean that. Don't assume that every time you feel something that it's the spirit, it could be your flesh. How do we know the difference between the spirit and the flesh? The word of God. Because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Remember how I told you? That five of those seven churches had apostated from the truth in some way. There are only two churches that didn't stray away from the Lord. One of those churches was Ephesus. Now, I want to know the reason why they never apostatized. And if the reason's in Scripture. 
It's Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. You know why they never apostatized? Because they would root out false teachers. They would root out false teaching. It would never get past the door. Christian, do you know what my desire for you is? I'm bringing this home, so everybody look up this way. I got, I'm, I'm, I'm fixing to land the plane. Do you know what my desire for you is? My desire is as you become a, a soldier of this book. I want you to become a soldier of this book. As much as you hear teaching and preaching, as much as you want others to hear it, you take what you hear from me. You take what you hear from the teachers in this church. You take what you hear from other preachers. You listen to religious songs. And you hear that and you test it and you compare it to the word of God. I want nothing to get by you. I want you to be so in love with truth that daily you're examining the scriptures. You hear a doctrine and you say to yourself, why do we believe that? Is that what the Bible really says? And then you go to the word of God on your own volition and you investigate it for yourself. And you, if you can't remember a verse, you go to Google and you look up the verse and you find the verse. You pull up and you get a concordance and you look in cross references and you read commentaries and you go to BibleGateway.com and you take that one verse and you read it in every English translation so you can better understand it. Have you ever studied your Bible that way? If you have, when is it, when's the last time that you've done that? I want you to be a church member that rightly divides the word of truth. I want you to be an apostate profiler that can identify and train yourself to identify false teaching. You pick up on it instantly. Do you want to know what the, one of the greatest problems the church is facing today? It's Bible illiteracy. People don't know their Bibles anymore. And it's the reason why in the new year, we're going to take eight to ten weeks and we're going to teach a sermon series on why we believe what we believe. And what would this look like if we did all those things? What would our church look like if we made the word of God supreme and we examined everything that was taught and we learned it for ourselves? What would our church look like then? Well, we would start filling up this auditorium every Sunday morning. We would start filling it up. Not just filling it up on homecoming. Not just filling it up on the holidays. Not just filling it up on Sundays. But we would start filling up this auditorium every Sunday morning. I have a vision for this church. I have a vision that one day... We have to go to two services on Sunday morning because we won't be able to fit the people in here at one time that are hungry and thirsty for the word of God. Because we will become a church that is hungry and thirsty for the word of God. A church that realizes that the world we live in is a desert and the only thing that is going to quench that thirst are the precious words of Scripture. I have a vision that our connect groups next year will begin to grow. We'll begin to invite people outside the church into our groups because we desperately want to share the word of God with them. And we take the pastor's sermon and we pick it apart. And we dig in. And we dive deeper. And we reexamine the scripture. We call out false teaching in every form. I hope that we won't be like that church in Revelation that lost their, that lost, that left their first love. But may we be like the church that receives the word with great eagerness and examines the scriptures daily. 
I challenge you today. I challenge you to ask the Spirit to give you an eagerness and a hunger for the words of God more than you have now. And for the Spirit to help you remember the words that were spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we be a church where apostasy doesn't thrive. May we be a church that's so in love with the Scripture was so in love with the eternal words of life that apostasy doesn't thrive, it dies. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In just a minute, we're going to have an invitation. When we have that invitation, the altar will be open. If you so choose to come down and pray and pray in this altar, nobody's going to think any less of you if you want to use this altar. Nobody's going to think you're repenting of some great sin just because you come to an altar to pray. No one's going to mess with you or talk to you unless you want somebody to pray with you. And we turn the cameras off during invitation. But we're going to have an invitation. And I'm going to ask you whether here at this altar or in your seat you do business with God. And you ask the Spirit to, to make you sensitive to, to, pick, to pick up on false teaching where you won't be fooled by it. And ask Him to give you a love for the Word of God more than you have now. We're going to pray, and then our invitation will begin. Thank you, dear Lord, for everything you've done for us today. Lord, I pray that you bless this invitation. Lord, I don't know what people need. But may we just take a few minutes at the end of this service and spend some time meditating on the word, spend some time in prayer, begging the spirit to give us a hunger and thirst for the word of God that we've never experienced before. Bless our invitation. And, and as always, if there be one person in here today that doesn't know that they're saved, they don't know that their final destination is heaven. Lord, please help them know they can come to this altar and we'll take a Bible and show them how they can know that they know that their eternal home is in heaven. Bless our invitation. In Jesus Christ's precious name I pray.